and now introduce Indira Knight and take it away. Hi, yeah, um, yeah, my name's Indira and I work at the Helen Hamlin Centre for Design at the Royal College of Art. And I'm also actually a Mozilla tech speaker, so I often give talks about WebVR and Arduino. Um, and I wanted to talk today um, about designing a participatory design workshop. Um, about two years ago, I started on a project called Game Change, which is, oops, I can click in here, um, which is a virtual reality therapy for people with psychosis to help them feel more confident in everyday situations. And a really important part of this was um, the participatory design, the co-designing with people with lived experience of psychosis. So I want to talk a bit about how that worked today. And I also thought it might be quite nice as it's in VR and we can move around a space, is to go through one of the workshops. So part of the co-design, we ran workshops around the UK with people with lived experience of psychosis. So I thought today it might be quite nice to just go through some of the workshop, how I designed the workshop, how it was maybe different from other workshops I designed, and then sort of do a, almost like a role play of that workshop. So just to go a bit about the project, this slide shows the people who were involved in the project. So we got funded by the National Institute of Health Research. I think it was about four million pounds. And the University of Oxford psychologists from there were um, heading this. So they've done work in virtual reality before for um, different mental health conditions and worked with people with psychosis. So they were leading it. Um, they created a spin-off company called Oxford VR to build the VR and we worked also closely with a company called the a foundation called the McPin Foundation so they work with people with mental health issues to make sure they're involved in in the research into into that mental health so so with this um, they set up a lived experience advisory panel and they may they're, they're still meeting because this project at the moment is in its second year it's just starting the third year so in the first year, it was the design and development of the project. And then um, the, the, the R was actually built. And it's now in clinical trial 432 people um, in England to see if the virtual reality can help. I'll go in more into what the virtual reality is when I go into the bit of that's the actual workshop. But I just sort of say so it, it is a standalone therapy um, and people are in different environments that they can try out and see if they can use different methods to control their anxiety. So I don't know if people know what psychosis is. I just thought I'd put a brief sort of definition. It's a mental health problem that causes people to perceive or interpret things differently from those around them. This might involve hallucinations or delusions. And psychosis often leads to social isolation. People feel um, anxious and worried about going outside for a number of reasons that um, and they use and this makes them socially isolated which then can cause other health problems as well so it can sort of be the sort of spiral and I just wanted to show this slide it's this is it, this is a really rough idea of how the project was set up so in the first year where I was heavily involved was the design of the project, um, the design of the virtual reality and the building of the virtual reality. And as I say, Oxford VR built it, but we worked with people with lived experience psychosis in the design. And workshops was one part of that. We also had design sessions where we worked with people with lived experience, plus the psychologists and the developers and the designers ourselves. And we met almost weekly over a number of months. And that was a chance for people to put ideas together, to quickly find out if things worked or not, um, get feedback between all, all the parties. So for example, if we had one idea where there were people, someone in the virtual reality would be catching balloons, but because we had the developers there, they, they could tell us that actually catching balloons is quite a difficult thing to do in virtual reality to make sure the physics is right. right. Um, so, we knew sort of straight away that wouldn't work. So it was really good having that sort of quick feedback. We had the lived experience advisory panel that's set up by the McPin Foundation. And they um, meet, they're still meeting. They meet a number of times each year. 
And in the first meeting, they helped us design the scenarios, the different environments that would be in the VR. They sort of said which ones were most important. And we could also go to them remotely. Um, like that. We could go to them remotely as well and ask some questions and they also helped us set up the workshops so it's actually the workshops that i wanted to talk about today was about how we went around designing the workshops as i said we had six well in the end seven workshops um, with people with lived experience of psychosis um the reason these were slightly different from the other sessions was these really were any idea was taken seriously there wasn't any no's it's not like oh we can't do that in vr oh no that's not the psychology behind that this was people's thoughts um, and views and the way they wanted it designed. So we could really get, theirs was the people's psychosis, theirs was the main voice in these sessions. And at the start of designing, um, one of the first things we did was we talked to the psychologists, we talked to them at PIM Foundation, and we talked to the developers, um, because we were all facilitators together in the workshop. And we did have quite a lot of facilitators in the workshop. And we always made sure we had psychologists there because some of the things that people might experience, because everyone did try VR, but they didn't have to, but everyone did try VR. It could cause anxiety. It could. Um, so we always made sure we had psychologists there who work with people who have psychosis. And we also made sure that there was space outside the main area that people could go to if they need to break, as well as a, a, enough space in the room that they could bring support workers with them or they and they could bring uh, or family members if they wanted to. So we wanted to make sure this was a really safe space that people could say what they want. If they didn't want to say anything, that was fine. If they wanted, we had enough facilitators that if they wanted to talk to a facilitator and they could speak for them or write something down for them um, and express their views, that was available. So it really sort of people could get involved. Um, I don't know if you can see this on the screen in VR, but this was the um, this was the I wanted to talk through today the second workshop we did. So in the second workshop, we had a series of aims, and I suppose this is how I suppose anyone starts the design of any workshop. You work out what your aims are and what it is you want to find out. And again, this was often done by talking to the psychologists and also talking to developers to see what they needed for, to be able to develop. And it also, um, we looked at previous workshops. So we always looked at previous workshops and feedback from the LEAP and the design sessions to sort of decide what is it we need to know at this point. So at this particular workshop, we were looking at a number of things. There were some questions. The therapy is inside VR. Everything takes place inside VR. So it is standalone and there's a virtual coach that talks, that walks you through um, and helps you decide which scenario you want to go into and gives any advice and gives support. And we were looking at what, how that coach should look. We've done some previous work on what people thought would make a good coach. And now we're looking at if the coach had to be a freestanding person who was fully in the scene. So, you know, full body, um, you could interact with that person or if people would be happy with the person being inside a, a screen so either a phone would come up and the coach would be there to give support or an iPad or something like that we also were asked to check if people would mind having audio so that was one of the things we looked at the other thing we we're looking at is though it didn't actually make it into the VR but elements did we were looking at having a space at the end that people could relax in, somewhere they could go to sort of what unwind before taking the headset off. Um, so this, we were looking at what people found relaxing, and this we did over a number of sessions. Um, so that was that was one of the things we were looking at, and the last one was um, the overall flow. So when someone comes into VR, how does it feel? Where do they go? Um, how do they choose a room to go to? What feels good in VR, what doesn't? So we sort of had those aims at the beginning. And I don't know if you can see this, but this is just part of then I write an agenda. So I just made an agenda of what we'd be doing, 
what the activity would be, what the um, materials that I needed to create would be. And I think um, most of the time I overcreated materials. I had a lot more materials than I needed. And this meant that there could be flexibility in the workshop um, because some things worked and some things didn't. And you couldn't always tell until you got there. You wouldn't necessarily know the space you're in until you got there. Um, so I sort of over-designed in a way and had lots of materials that I could use if needed. So once that was all set up, we then went to the different places in England. And from this point, I, this is actually the bit where I want it to be, I want to give you a taste of what the workshop was like. So these, the following slides are all from the workshop. So this is how we would come into the space. Um, we'd all sit around in, in a group. We'd all introduce ourselves, we'd introduce the project. And we'd normally then at some point, either before or during it, have lunch together. So we'd sit and have lunch and chat. So that was that. But I thought I'd just give you an idea of what the workshop was. So I'd start the workshop by introducing the Royal College of Art. Because the Royal College of Art, it's a postgraduate college of art and design um, where people do masters and PhDs, but we also do research, particularly in design. And the Helen Hamlin Center, where I work, um, is involved very much in people centered design. So we work with people who will be using the, the product, whatever we're making, to help in the design process. And that's a very important part, part of it for us. And that's why we're sort of running the workshop today. And we were brought into the project um, to work with people. So then I would just introduce the agenda that we do introductions. So we'd have an introduction to the project um, into VR and each other. Um, and then there would be lunch, followed by looking at the coach avatar, looking at the end of session, how the relaxation is, and looking at user engagement, how to keep people engaged and how the flow could help with that. Um, so, just turn so I can see this a bit better on the screen. So the VR therapy itself, as I said, it's a totally enclosed therapy, so it's standalone, but there would always be a peer support worker with the person in it. And it's as it's self-contained, there's a virtual coach that I said who helps people through that. And then it will contain six scenarios. So these are virtual environments that are sort of everyday environments. So they are they're a pub, a cafe, a street, a bus, a GP's waiting room and a corner shop. And within each of these scenarios, there will be five different tasks that people have to do. And these tasks get continued. They get increasingly harder, not in they're harder to do, but they're harder to stay in that situation. So in, in the pub, for example, it starts off and you're in the pub and it's fairly quiet and you're standing there and you have to wait for someone to arrive. And then in the next level, it's you're doing the same thing, but this time there's more people in the pub, there's more noise. And then at one point, um, there's a football fan who will walk over to you and ask you to um, where the toilet is. So you actually have to interact with someone that people might find causes anxiety. Um, the, the sessions themselves, when people are in the therapy sessions, we imagine they'd be about um, 30 minutes long. And the environments themselves, these are sort of images that we did actually show at the workshop because we, at that point we didn't have the virtual environments built, they're still being designed. Um, but they were very much everyday environments. We wanted to make sure they're not London centric. So I want to make sure that they're places that people recognize. So it's a general coffee shop. It's a coffee shop like a, you'd go in on a high street. The street, again, is a very generalized street. It's not old, it's not new. It's sort of a, a general place where people live. It's not particularly, it's not run down, but it's not really um, posh either. It's sort of that middle sort of environment. And the bus would be a single decker bus, um, partly because we didn't want the element of stairs coming in because people would be able to go upstairs, sort of keep it on that level. The pub, again, a general pub that is on every high street. And with the um, GP's waiting room, 
there was a decision there that there would be glass in front of the receptionist just to make it feel it's a bit harder to deal with it's a bit harder being in there and again it was a corner shop so it's just a shop that people go in every day um and the therapy is everyday situations and it's to help people evaluate the accuracy of their fears of being in that situation. Um, there are things called defense behaviors that people have to get through their situations if they have to go into them. So a lot of people wouldn't go in the situation in the first place, but if they have to, they might only go at certain times a day or they might rush through very quickly to make sure they're out and as quickly as possible, not looking at anyone, maybe wearing a hat or glasses. So this is to evaluate doing something differently and seeing if that makes you feel less anxious. Um, and sort of see if the accuracy of the fears and by doing something, if you can sort of lower those fears and realize that outside the general world is a safe enough place to be in. And what we're looking at today is people keeping presence in VR. So once they're in that environment, they really feel that they're there. How can we achieve that? Um, the engagement that people feel engaged in the process and that it's easy to use so that people um, feel that they, yeah, they can easily know what they need to do and the technology isn't hindering them. Um, and so then it gives sort of an idea of, of what the session is about to develop ideas for the end session to find out how people feel and presented in different ways and um, how the flow of the application could be made better. So those are the workshop aims. And these were, I say, this is a slide from the workshop. So this is what people saw in the introduction. And then we got onto the workshop activities and that's something I'd like to try today. I mean, I know we're not in a workshop and we haven't got post-it notes um, and things like that, but I have put around this room, you can see a number of different things. So in this, everyone got the chance to try virtual reality um, and everyone actually did. So I've put over, towards the balcony, just a clip of some of the virtual reality they would have seen during this session. Say so in this session, we didn't have any actual work from the developers because they're still working on that. So we created, a colleague of mine, Paul, created some prototypes. So up near the balcony, I've just got some films that you could press play and you can watch to get an idea of what people would have seen. Then over sort of opposite where the balcony is, there is a worksheet which has the images of the coach and for you to say strengths and weaknesses of a full length coach of it being in a um in a box and voice only and then going to slide to the other side of that there are some images of um places to get ideas of whether people find those relaxing or not and then there's also the example of the worksheet that I created for that and also the questionnaire I created for that as well to get an idea of what people find re relaxing so what I did again in this it would have been post-its in the actual workshop people put on their post-its of um, what they found caused anxiety Anxiety with those images and what they found relaxing with this, within those images. And then outside on the balcony is a flow diagram, which I think I can show it to you here. So yeah, so they're the two um, the coach pictures, the environment. And then there was a flow diagram. So this is a flow diagram of the actual um, the application of when people come in, what they see, what sort of branching there is at different points of it. And out on the balcony is a worksheet which looks at um, the ways that people might want to interact, what would make them want to stay in that space. Um, today we are hoping that you, you, know, you can go around and have sort of 10 minutes to look at these. So imagine that you're in the workshop and you're doing these workshop activities. Because we don't have post-its, we're hoping you'd be able to draw on these. We seem to have a problem with the pen. I think maybe Thomas went through that. Um, and yeah. so I don't know if you explain what we <laughs> thought instead is just go into the object, so the little wand, and find an object that 
you feel relates your feeling about that. So for the images, maybe go over. And if there's an area that you find makes you feel anxious, put some sort of image that you, you feel um, represents that. Or if you think there's something that's nice, something that represents that. And so, because in the workshop, we did get people to split into groups and do things separately. So I thought it'd be nice just to spend 10 minutes to have a look around, um, have a look at the workshop materials, and then just try filling them in with the means we have in VR at the moment. So I don't know if Thomas, you want to add anything on how people can do that or if you've explained. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you all can hear me, like I think this is our exciting experiment. Um, I'm, I'm really excited Indira wants to make this interactive. So unfortunately. I can't hear you, Thomas. You're very muffled. Should be a way we can Mark thing is not working, but I do believe. Yeah, me too. I can't hear you. If you use the wand icon, which is the pink icon, yeah. you can actually choose objects to insert. Yeah, yeah so that if, if people want to use the wand icon, they have to choose the objects. And if people want to go and have a look around now, and then we'll join back here in a, in a, yeah. and we'll help in a few minutes. We'll help um, and <laughs> yeah, we'll take 10 minutes. Help you. Yeah, and uh, have a look around and, and then we come back and I can sort of tell you what the reaction were to these during the workshop and what worked and what didn't. All right, I'm going to go over to this first wall, wall which turns out we can but we do have multiple walls. Yeah, I'm going to go over to the, um, the scene wall. So if anyone wants to come there and have a look at that. I'm just going to go and have a look at the video. So this is a prototype video that people would have been inside in VR.
I'll just have a look outside in the balcony. In the balcony space, people could again put post-its in. We had this these up as A4 sheets on the wall. So uh, the therapy room start of session, intro to the scene, the pause, end of session. And we asked people what they'd want to happen in this space, um, what would make them want to go back, so sort of get an idea of how, how it could look. Have a look at the last wall. Hello. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, I, I yeah. went back on my desktop because I, I, I stopped being able to hear on my... Um, yeah, you're clear now as well. Okay. Yeah, so um, I just wanted to add that, like, I think, like, I love this idea. Um, the writing wand should, should be working in mozilla hubs which we were thinking maybe like to be able to tick or like put something underneath the strengths or weaknesses um oh, but no. i thought Here it was we go again. Idea i'm back out on the sea oh no <laughs> hello oh. hello oh, you're out welcome back we oh hello sorry <laughs> we can guide you back. this is utterly bizarre sorry guys i didn't realize my mouth my mic was uh <laughs> There's a strange feeling when you end up over the water, and it's just yeah, there. It yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's quite interesting, though. I quite like it. <laughs> right, right. I just thought everyone was standing there looking at me, and I was like stuck out in the lake. My keyboard went all wonky as well. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! We didn't see you at all. Yeah. We we didn't notice. Anyway, you're there. <laughs> nice to hear you, Indira. Sorry, Thomas. Yeah. 
Yeah, ahead. no, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, no, and like we said, this is all an experiment. So I was really happy that Indira wanted to do this because we're we're trying to learn how to use these environments and then, you know, participate. So we want your feedback and like I already have feedback from what I was trying to do. Um, but I thought it was really interesting to be able to use the space. Like we don't want to just have people come here and watch a presentation. Yeah. We want to do interactivity. And like we want to figure out how to do that. So mm -hmm. I'm excited. Great stuff. We'll do. I I will comment for sure on the whole thing after. Yep. Great. So I think I'll go Is back. So are we looking at this like, wall or are we looking like, at specific? Do we want to like? Do you want to like go back to your mm. presentation or yeah, do you want to? Yeah, I can go like, back to the presentation we'll... and then people can always come and have a look at these after. So it's basically to say you could have a look and see get an idea of what it was like to be in that workshop. Because um, then I wanted to have quickly talk about sort of what worked and what didn't and what I learned. Because what I found is in a way we had the luxury of running seven workshops. I learned a lot over that time on what worked and what didn't. And this that you're seeing now that was out on the balcony didn't work. So I'm. it's interesting. I had actually planned to have this worksheet with it to get people to really think about um, what would be in each part of it. It was done, I think partly it was done at the end of the day. So it was quite a long afternoon. People were tired. And it's also, I realized that I'd been thinking about the flow a lot. You know, you're designing a VR application. You're thinking about the people, the where people come in, where people branch off to a different environment, how they choose the environment, how they might pause it. But it's something that's quite abstract if you haven't been thinking about it for a while. So I think that didn't help. And the fact that by the end of the day, everyone was tired. So initially, what I wanted to do was people to have a brainstorm, exactly like the one on the balcony. So they would see that and they would put ideas and then work in pairs to come up with how, um, how that actually might work and then fill out another worksheet. But in the end, Though I say it didn't work, it didn't work how I planned, but people did come up with ideas for the one on the balcony. They did put things on post-its on walls. And some really good ideas came out of it, particularly around the pause and what it might be like. So the idea with the pause was if you're really anxious in VR, instead of taking the headset off and coming back to your action environment, you still stay in virtual reality. And again, they weren't used... Um, in the therapy in the end. But it was just interesting to see some of the ideas that people came up with to do that, of whether it's it's a something that just freezes the environment, so you're still in the same environment, but everything stops, whether sound comes down slowly, um, or whether it goes to complete darkness and you sort of get sort of like this complete break from what you're seeing. So while the workshop activity didn't work some good ideas came out of it and made me realize again how i needed to maybe develop the material slightly differently um but the other two work quite well so looking at the spaces that made people feel anxious or calm um work so I, again i think next time i did it i thought about the pictures i'd chosen and especially from the comments coming back, added different sort of would make different pictures. I wanted to make different pictures. And in other ways, we talked about different environments. Um, but this, with people putting up post-its on what they find um, relaxing or not, gave really good feedback into things that I would find relaxing. Other people might find would make them feel vulnerable, particularly if the space was too open or there could be people hiding behind things. And then this worksheet worked well just to find out a general view on what it, relaxing environments would have in them, the colours, uh, people getting to draw them. That worked really well. And again, though we didn't have an end space that people could relax in, a lot of the work we did on this did influence the coach's room. So when someone first comes into the environment, they go into a room that's different from all the other environments where the coach can introduce them and um, into the therapy and get them to choose a scenario. And at the end, they come back to that environment so the coach can sort of have a, you know, how did that go? How are you feeling now? Think about what you've learned through this. And that did, from these 
uh, workshops that did influence what that environment looked like. And again, with the coach, the coach was, was very interesting. Go back to the coach because we went for a full bodied coach who is there. And while some people did like the idea of a coach in, in some sort of technology in a phone or in an iPad shaped thing, most people preferred that person was there with them. Um, and so that's what we went with. So that was really useful to know. And the leap went on to help with the general design of the coach in, in other sessions. Um, so, so really my conclusions from running this workshops and running the whole lot of them is how important it was to take from one to the next. And as I said before, to keep almost to have to be able to keep it really flexible so the design while they were always very set aims and i tried to have everything quite organized for the day i i would be definitely be very flexible in how it was delivered and if something wasn't working on the spot come up with a different way of doing it so the one that's on the balcony of the flows when i realized that the idea of get people pairing off didn't work we actually just had a general conversation with people who still felt like being in that conversation and discuss their ideas. So it became far more just an informal chat after the brainstorming. Um, and throughout all the workshops, I kept them in, in this way. I would often change how an activity was run to make sure that people could get involved as much as they could. Um, the importance of having that safe space that people feel they can leave at any time that, um, they know they know who everyone in the room is to make sure that we've explained our roles properly and why why we're there. And and again, yes, general just take the feedback and we always had a sort of general feedback wall for VR and people could write notes on what they thought of VR. So it's just having lots of different ways that people could communicate with us if they didn't want to speak, um, have the writing, if they didn't feel how comfortable writing, have someone to talk to so that people could get involved um, throughout. And that's the end of my presentation. So I don't know if people have any questions. If you want more information on the project, that's the website and the, um, the Twitter handle. As I say, it's sort of starting the third year soon. Um, the clinical trials, I assume, will be getting close to the end. I'm not sure how the shutdown, lockdown has affected those. But the aim is that if it works and it gets through clinical trials, this would be used in the NHS. So the final bit of the work being done would look at how this could be used, the sort of the economy of this being used in the NHS and how to get it delivered in the NHS. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Uh, yeah, so I just want to say thank you, Indira, so much for the presentation today. and again for working with us in this new environment um i i i guess my first question would be um just from doing a user study or like some of the things that we see in the room like where did you see most of the post-it notes or where did you see like when you did this test in the real world like what did what did you what kind of feedback did you get for strengths and weaknesses um the strengths and weaknesses, so the strength for a full-bodied um, coach is that there is someone there with you and you feel that they're, it's, it's, it's almost emulating somebody going out with you into the real world and you feel that support. Um, whereas if it was called up on a phone, it would just feel a bit too remote and it, and it looked a bit funny um, that you know, someone was cut off. The audio, we actually knew before we asked that it wouldn't, we sort of, we guessed it wouldn't work. I wouldn't say we knew it because we hadn't asked people. We guessed it wouldn't work because one of the symptoms of psychosis is, is hearing voices and having voices in your head. So actually having a disembodied voice as a coach, we felt wouldn't work. But we wanted to ask to see um, yeah. and find out. And, and that was the general view. Yes, it wouldn't work. Um, there were some comments that people quite liked having a coach in maybe in a mobile thing that it, they felt more in control, that they could bring that person in and out when they wanted to. Um, but the over, overwhelming response was that it felt more natural to have a full-bodied person there. Um, so 
that actually then became so it really did influence the final outcome because we did get a full body coach um thank you thank and you. and definitely with with the relaxation it helped in in finding that end space um and the coach design in the coach's room if anyone else has any questions Hello there. Uh, does anyone out there have any questions? Well, then, thank, thank you for coming today. Um, this is the first time I've well, half presented in VR, I started in VR and then came to the laptop. It's been interesting <laughs> to develop a talk for this. And, and I love this project, so it's always you know, good to, to, to be able to sort of talk about it. So thank you for coming today.